Well, let's uh, take a few moments now just to, as we say, get into the flow. And put ourselves in a consciousness of receptivity. Each of us has a desire to gain new insights into ourselves, into life, into the truth. Not that we can acquire more knowledge, accumulate more facts, but that we can gain a greater level of perception so that we can know ourselves and give a greater releasement to the imprisoned splendor within us. So tonight we want to be receptive not just to words that come to us, for in a larger sense, let that be only background music to what comes in us. That which flows from our own inner self. This is the truth that sets us free. In a very real sense, it's not just words, but it's awareness, consciousness, much of which is nonverbal. So let's just know that we're open and receptive tonight to a deeper awareness of ourselves. And that as we go forth from here tonight, much more prominent than anything we can remember hearing, there will be awareness that enables us to see clearly, to know to a little greater degree who we are and where we're going and what we're doing in life and how we best can relate ourselves to people and situations. So we acknowledge this truth, we're receptive to it, and we're ready for the flow. And so be it. Now this uh, series on the Ten Commandments I think is important, first of all, because uh, we must challenge ourselves with the insight that there's so much more involved in the superficial reading of the commandments. The, the very term, Ten Commandments, has become one of the greatest cliches in modern times. The idea, just live by the Ten Commandments and everything will be fine, and uh, the average person hasn't the slightest idea what they are, let alone what they mean. And the emphasis in our religious background has been on keeping the commandments, and it's my contention that we've kept them, but we've kept them all too well. And now we need to learn how to break them, to learn how to break them down, to make them relevant in terms of our life and times today and in terms of our present consciousness, so that they actually become guidelines toward an integrative life, uh, not just as a means of improving conduct or of changing character, but uh, as a help in modifying consciousness, because this is where it's really at. And unless we change consciousness, we really don't change much. This is why I've suggested time and time again that, that though stress is often placed upon morals and ethics, though the teaching of morality and ethical behavior is good, excellent, and helpful, yet it is really not enough because it does not lead to an integration of the self. One can be morally upright and ethically uh, true in all that he does and still behind that be very frustrated in terms of things that he really has the urge to do but doesn't do. He doesn't do them because it would be immoral. But when we understand the spirit of the law, we realize that that, that type of restraint in consciousness, as Jesus so clearly points out in the, in the commandment we're going to deal with next week, uh, is, uh, is in fact the, the breaking of the commandment itself. In other words, just a little uh, brief look at the next week. You know, next week we're going to deal with thou shalt not commit adultery. And this is one that normally is not talked about in good uh, company. But he says, uh, you have heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, he that looks upon a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery. So then we begin to understand that... Uh, that on the superficial level, the commandments deal with morality and ethics. But Jesus says there's so much more than that. It's not enough not to steal, not to kill, but the important thing is that we must not even think it. And this gets into some rather hard and difficult areas, as we'll see tonight. Now, the sixth commandment that we're dealing with tonight is, Thou shalt not kill. 
And first of all, this is, uh, this is one of um, three commandments that deal with uh, what we might call the citizen's duty to his neighbor, murder and adultery and uh, theft. Now, in any discussion of uh, the world situation or the economy or the morality in politics or uh, just about any kind of a sharing time on, on the problems of humankind, someone invariably will come up with the statement, well, now, really, all we really need to do is teach people the Ten Commandments and be sure they live by them, and we wouldn't have any problems. And occasionally you read that in the letters to the editor in the paper. I read them quite often as sort of a hobby to see what people are thinking about. All you've got to do is keep the commandments and everything will be fine. All right, now let's take a look at that without... without uh, really breaking down the statement itself, let's say, all right, if everybody kept the Ten Commandments, things would be fine. Right away, I would ask the person, what of the Sixth Commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Oh, well, obviously, I would never kill. Well, it's a plain, flat statement without qualification or modification. And uh, what does this uh, advocate of the Decalogue say? Does he accept it unequivocally? Does he mean that, that this means in every, every case? Well, he said, I certainly wouldn't kill. No killing at all? No destruction of life of any kind? You wouldn't even kill a bug? Or cut down a tree? Or kill meat? Or, you, or, or kill, you know, eat meat or kill animals? Uh, or kill in self-defense? What about capital punishment? What about war? In other words, the whole spectrum of these things. Well, suddenly our Ten Commandments supporter begins to run for cover. He will say, well, of course we have to eat meat to get proper protein, and, and it's my understanding that Jesus ate meat. And he will say, I think I have a perfect right to kill in self-defense, and society has a perfect right to kill defenders, and a nation has a perfect right to kill its enemies in war. And the person may say, well, I certainly deplore all of this, and uh, generals are the greatest deplorers of all. But uh, he has no doubt but that, uh, that God is always on the side of the just nation. Now, where does this leave the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not kill, which is rather unequivocally stated. In other words, when you get right down to it, even on the superficial level, nobody but a crank would take it literally. And yet it said all we have to do is live by the Ten Commandments. Nearly everyone believes that under certain conditions it's right and proper to kill. Whether that belief is right or not, I don't know. But uh, almost everybody comes up with, with something or has some sort of an expedient uh, shelter from this coverage of the commandment. For instance, thou shalt not kill has totally confounded the Western world of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism for thousands of years, proven by the fact that the bloodiest of all wars in history of the world have been religious wars under these banners, all of which accept the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Yes, everything would be fine if we followed the Ten Commandments, but suddenly we realize that it is not just that we try to follow them and fail, but that when confronted by such as these four plain words, thou shalt not kill, we tend to interpret them as we want to, or perhaps we have created an eleventh commandment, thou shalt follow the Ten Commandments until they really pinch. In other words, instead we have preferred to follow the rationalistic philosophy of the preacher of Ecclesiastes who says a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. So where does that leave the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill? It's rather strange when we stop and think about it. I just make a few off-the-cuff observations here because uh, I, I in no way want to, to imply 
personal bias or, uh, or to get into any sort of political overtones, but just take a look at, at the way the thinking goes in our day. It's strange how much strong resistance and bitterness and hatred there will be directed toward, say, a war resistor, a person who absolutely refuses to kill. And how we tend to, at times, resent and resist movements of nonviolence. And how many arguments are set forth against such things as gun control, even though guns are created to kill. And that the vast majority of murders are done not by criminals, but by the average individual in an emotional tantrum on the spur of the moment, and a handy gun simply spurs the moment. But again, this is, this is something that we must look at as we deal with this commandment on its superficial level, you know, and how we tend to find every way we can to get out from under it. It's like, uh, I love George Bernard Shaw, and uh, I think he was certainly one of the great wits of uh, modern times, if not one of the greatest of all times, and uh, sometimes his wit was pretty caustic. He wasn't always comfortable to listen to. Uh, back during the First World War, he published an article. It was entitled, Common Sense About War. He laid it on the line, and they laid him low. He became the most hated man in England during this time because they were in the middle of a war and they'd been whipped up in patriotic passion and everybody was sacrificing for the war and all out to kill the enemy and so forth. And it must be said uh, uh, parenthetically that, uh, that George Bernard Shaw was not originally a pacifist. But he began to see the illogic of the whole thing. And especially it came to him in terms of the failure of the churches and of religious teachers. Interestingly enough, this article was republished in the 30s after the war was over and people were having second thoughts about what it accomplished and most of them concluding that it was a total waste. The, the, the article then was widely heralded and uh, Shaw came into his own at that time and was greatly accepted. But as I said, the article basically referred to the failure of the churches and the failure of religious leaders to maintain any shred of Jesus' teaching of peace. He said, We turn our temples of peace promptly into temples of war and exhibit our parsons as the most pugnacious characters in the community. He says, When a bishop at the first shot abandons his Christian teaching and rallies his flock around the altar of Mars, he may be acting patriotically and manfully, and possibly rightfully, he says. But it doesn't justify him from pretending that there has been no change. So he says, and he, he really is serious about this, he's not criticizing their stand, but he says the straightforward course would be to close the churches for the duration of the war and reopen them only when a treaty of peace has been signed. He was chagrined at the spectacle of nations praying to their common father to assist them in blowing one another to pieces, and of the churches organizing this monstrous paradox instead of protesting against it. Well, again, these were thoughts of Shaw, and we don't want to belabor that point. Now, certainly on a sociological level, this sixth commandment has been the basis for for some pretty sound uh, fundamental codes, legal codes, and moral restraints that have produced the cultural awareness that we refer to as civilization. There's no doubt about that. And as we see, its essence has been soft-pedaled, rationalized, and its compliance pretty selective. But let's take a look at, at some of the attitudes that Jesus had. We've, we've noted that, that uh, Jesus was uh, somewhat radical in his view, considered so, basically because he didn't accept the letter of the creeds and codes and observances and commandments of the old. But uh, this didn't mean that he wasn't a good Jew. In his mind, he was a very faithful, loyal Jew, but he was looking for the truth. And he said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So that always he, 
He said, ye have heard it said of old, and then he would quote one of the commandments or one of the teachings of the Old Testament, and then he'd say, but I say unto you, and he would give it a new insight. So in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, we have heard that it was said to them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in the danger of the judgment. Now on that level, obviously, the good worshiper in the temple could nod his head and say that's right that's right i wouldn't kill anybody absolutely not i keep the law but then just imagine how that head nodding suddenly stopped when he said but i say unto you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother raka which literally meant worthless one shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of the hell fire. In other words, instead of trying to narrow the commandment into this strict ethical sense of killing, and then as the intellect normally does to ethics, it plays with it back and forth in one way or another until you begin to decide uh, who can be killed and who can kill and who can get away with it and who can't and so forth. This is the way the ethical approach usually takes it. But instead of following this pathway, Jesus broadened the application of the fundamental spiritual law into the whole area of destructive tendencies of the mind. Now who can sit back and say, well, after all, I wouldn't break that commandment. When was the last time you were angry at anybody? So the commandment pertains to you and me. It's a very practical thing, and it's not... It's not a law that says you can't do this, you must not do this, or I'm going to punish you. But it's dealing with fundamental laws of consciousness. And it provides also some very helpful insights into what we can do. In other words, Jesus went on from there. And uh, I think we should consider some of his added points. He said, ye have heard that it was said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil. But whosoever smiteth thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, obviously, if a person was in this consciousness, there would never be the act of violence. And certainly what he's saying is you've got to erase the thought of violence from your consciousness. And the turn the other cheek here deals, I'm sure, with turning to a higher state of consciousness. On the human level, you may say, he has no right to do that to me, but on the finer side of your nature there is that within you that says but if I am upset about it then somehow I must have drawn it to me you see so I must turn to the other side of my consciousness where instead of reacting in hostility I begin to think in self-awareness self-discipline and in thoughts of love Jesus also said ye have heard that it was said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy but I say unto you love your enemies And pray for them that persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In other words, what he's saying is, to have an enemy is to have enmity. And that means to be out of the flow of your own consciousness of love. And the enmity is in you. Nobody put it in you. It is the way in which you reacted to something someone else did. You can't really make an enemy, and you can't destroy an enemy. But you can pervert things that happen around you, or at least react to them in certain ways, so that you have a pool of perverted thought and negative thought in yourself, which is your enmity. You bear the grudge and the grudges of your own making. You carry this tremendous inner confusion of anger and hostility, which is entirely of your consciousness. And the only way it can be changed is for you to change it. This is what Jesus is saying. That you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven means that you may be in the flow of your own spiritual life and love and substance. And you get out of the flow and you destroy yourself when you're angry or upset or hostile or when you have enmity. You may recall the story that has been attributed, I think it was once attributed to Abraham Lincoln and a number of other people, As far as I know, it goes way back to one of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, long before the time of Jesus, in a time when it was common practice, fully expected of any uh, military leader, 
to totally destroy anyone who was captured. Now, they never took prisoners. That was just not ethical. It just wasn't done. You didn't, if a person was captured, he expected to be slaughtered. That was a part of the game of war. And so this particular pharaoh somehow had an odd idea that he'd gotten somewhere that, um, that the best way to destroy the enemy was to forgive him and win him over onto the side of a little different aspect of thinking and then set him loose. And he was terribly criticized by his associates. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was almost a revolution against him as a result of this. And his re remark was always, do I not destroy my enemies when I love them? How else can you destroy them? Now, that's something that, that we really need to think about. So we have to realize that divine law is inexorable. And we can talk about laws, and quite often the commandments are set forth as laws, but usually they're ethical laws in the way in which they're dealt with. But divine law is inexorable. You see, the way we've dealt with the law so-called of the commandment, thou shalt not kill, is we say, well, that means certain times you can kill and certain times you can't, and certain people can kill. The soldier or the policeman who sees a thief running down the street, he can kill. But nobody else can kill, you see. So we've done all sorts of things with them. But when you deal with divine law or any kind of natural law, it's inexorable. If I step off the platform and don't watch myself, gravity is not going to say, well, Butterworth is a pretty good guy. He spends most of his life trying to help people, so let's be easy on him. Don't you kid yourself. I'll get just as bad of bruises as anybody else, you see. Because the law is inexorable. And there's no equivocation. There's no way of getting around it. The law basically is supportive, as we've emphasized time and time again, if we understand it. The law of gravity is supportive. It keeps us in our seats. It helps us when we walk. We ne we're never out of it. And it's a great part of all the things we do because we work with it. It's supportive. But any time we get out of the flow or out of harmony with it or disregard this fundamental process, then, as we so often say, there's the devil to pay. But don't blame the devil, you see. It's just simply that, that we've disregarded the inexorable uh, self fulfilling activity of law. Now, what Jesus is saying, if you're angry with your brother, no matter what he has done, you're in danger of the judgment, or the judgment simply refers to the effect of consciousness, law of causation, law of karma, if you want, in danger of the judgment. As you sow, so shall you reap. If you get angry, you may say you have a perfect right to be angry, and you have. It's your mind, it's your life, you can do with it what you want. You can take poison three times a day if you want to, too. You have a right to. But you also might as well accept the fact that you have the responsibility to live with the results of what you do and how you think. And what he's saying is you're going to have some results. And he was not alone in that. Any psychiatrist or psychologist or medical doctor today will tell you that if you, uh, you're angry long enough... You're going to have heart trouble, you're going to have stomach ulcers, you're going to have all sorts of problems, let alone what it does to your personality and thus to your life and your relationships with people. So he's saying if you're angry at your brother, you are dealing in the destructiveness of your mentality. Now, this, if you will, strikes right at the heart of the so-called justified murders, such as war, or capital punishment. And I know some people don't like to think this because they have fixed minds about it in a political sense. You know, I'm a conservative and therefore I think so-and-so and I'm a liberal and I think so-and-so. And I say, break these things down for a moment. We're not thinking of politics and fixed views. We're looking at spiritual laws. And the point is, no matter what a criminal has done or what a nation has done, and some criminals and some nations have done some pretty heinous things, still under the law of consciousness, this is their problem with the divine law. And... The Old Testament says, and I think it refers to this specifically, it says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If somebody goes jumping off the, the platform recklessly, you don't have to sit back and say, I'm going to tell on you, I'm going to get back at you for that. Gravity says, vengeance is mine, because it's automatic, you see. In other words, this is not saying God is sitting up in the heavens and he's saying, I'm going to get these people for what they're doing, because we're dealing with divine law. And the 
inexorable result of the law manifests itself no matter who the person is or what the case is or, or how much is, is uh, in their defense. In other words, no matter what a criminal has done or what a nation has done, it is their problem with the divine law. We may seek vengeance and we may feel right and just in it in whatever way we do, but this is an attempt on our part to evade the law of consciousness. We may feel very right about being angry against someone, and uh, even as people in Old Testament times felt very right about the thought, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That meant it literally. In a modern day term, it would mean that if you were walking down the street and have your umbrella out and you're not watching where you're going and you got one of the little umbrella prongs sticking out as people often do and inadvertently and unthinkingly and certainly without any conscious desire to do so you run into someone and it runs right into his eye and puts his eye out under the Old Testament times you would have one of your eyes put out that was Levitical law an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth you see this is why Jesus said that, that there's something more involved in this. There's a law of consciousness. So the idea of vengeance was very common in Old Testament times, and it has been through all cultures. The idea that, that if someone has done something wrong, then you have a right to wreak vengeance upon him. There are cases in the courts right now where a woman in California supposedly took vengeance on a man who, I, who she says raped him, and now she's being prosecuted for murder, you see, because she killed a man. Well, there are all sorts of ramifications to this, but of course she's, she's going under the old law of the Wester of the United States that, uh, that uh, vengeance was, uh, was certainly lethal, legal and lawful and right for a person who's been wronged. But the great truth of spiritual consciousness is vengeance is mine, saith the law, saith the Lord, you see. So what another person does is the expression of his consciousness. Now, that's not always easy to accept because we're, we're so angry about it and so uptight about it that we want to make sure that he gets his. You know, there's that urge to see that he gets his. But as long as we have that urge, that feeling, that anger, that resistance, that desire to retaliate, even if we frustrate it, we are in the killing consciousness. And that goes pretty broad because that means something that perhaps some folks don't like to think about. If you're sitting watching television at night and you're watching the news and you know as well as I know that most of the evening news programs are just one constant passing parade of rapes and murders and killings and wrongs and illegalities and so forth. After all, what else is news, they say, because that's what people want to watch, they say. But that's what we get. And I'm not, in a sense, intimating that the, that the media is wrong to do this. But what I'm saying is, however it is done, who has done it and who's put it on the air, that's all a matter of their consciousness. But once it comes through the little box into our house, and we sit there and accept it, talk about it, say, isn't that terrible? Oh, that's awful. That person should be strung up. He should be locked up, thrown the key away. We should hang him and so forth. You are in the killing consciousness. That's what the commandment is talking about, thou shalt not kill. You're in that consciousness. And therefore, startling as it may seem, and some people don't like me when I say this, but I, I think that we, we've got to deal with things on this level, even if it's hard to accept. And that is that the person who reacts in anger or bitterness or hatred or the feeling of retaliation and revenge is just as guilty under the divine law as the person who committed the crime. Because we're dealing with law, the law of consciousness. Not ethics and behavior, but consciousness. That's what Jesus is talking about. And that's a hard one to work into and to live up to, isn't it? But in the long run, in so many other areas, we talk about consciousness, the importance of disciplining your thoughts, keeping your thoughts on the level of peace and loving and blessing. Where does all that go when we watch the terrible news programs and react and get uptight and say, that's terrible, simply terrible, simply terrible. 
It all goes down the drain. And then we can't understand. We can't understand why we say, I work so hard at this truth thing. I think good thoughts, and I speak the word, and I pray, and I treat for my things, and so forth. But look what happens. Yes, look what happens. Thou shalt not kill. Just one commandment. And down the drain it goes. Because we're right into the killing consciousness. Now, that may be a hard thing to accept. If you think about it a little bit. The physical act of violence that leads to killing, literal killing, is really an attempt on the part of someone, however misguided, to destroy something that he feels threatens him. Right? Just stop and think about it. Any case where someone has killed somebody, however misguided, maybe paranoid, maybe through some quirk of feeling, but maybe through some anger or hostility or great fear or insecurity, someone thinks somebody else threatens them in some way, to take something away from them, to expose them, to hurt them or harm them or whatever. And so it's this kind of consciousness that leads to the violence and killing. Now, we may be vindictive of the killer. Not so much because he had killing thoughts. I think if we had to split the hair, we would say, no, no, it's not that he had thoughts of violence, but that he didn't control his thoughts. How many of you have ever said, you would say jokingly, you would say, I didn't really mean it, but Freud had some things to say about that. When was the last time you heard somebody say or you said, I could kill him for that? Or, that just kills me. These are killing thoughts. And when you say, I could kill him for it, actually you say, I'm not a violent person. It could be said that you're not a violent person because you've learned to keep it all bottled up inside. So the person who breaks loose, who is not disciplined, who gives vent to this and does something about it, then is the one that we're vindictive toward. And, you know, maybe we feel right about that. Again, notice Jesus' thoughts on adultery which, again, we're going to deal with in great length next week. The idea that it's not a matter of just not, you know, doing the thing, refraining from committing adultery, but even thinking the thought is breaking the law. So even the thought of anger, even the feeling of, oh, I could shake him, you know, this sort of thing that we say. We Usually we modify it. We say, I could shake him. I could bang his head on the wall, you know, and so forth. We're thinking killing thoughts. And we're breaking the thou shalt not kill commandment. And that makes it very difficult, doesn't it? So in consciousness, at that moment, we've already put ourselves at cross purposes with the law, and the law is what it's all about. Not morality, not ethics. Sure, we got legality involved. If somebody puts a bullet through somebody's head, obviously he's broken a legal law. But if in his mind... He thinks anger, bitter thoughts. Then he's put himself at cross purposes with spiritual law. And that's what we're dealing with, the law of consciousness. Now, how do we change this pattern? First of all, by accepting the deeper awareness of the commandment. Stop kidding ourselves. It says, thou shalt not kill. Now, this was a restraining fence, as we've talked about it in so many of the other commandments. A wise society has used fences to keep people out of certain areas that perhaps they do not have the consciousness or the wisdom or good judgment to, to care for themselves in. So that uh, today we have signs everywhere that says no smoking. Or if uh, up in... Uh, Columbia University, they decide they want to plant grass in the main campanile and they want to keep the students off. They put signs, keep off the grass, which don't work. And so they put little fences and then pretty soon bigger fences and then pretty soon you have great big fences with barbed wire so that they keep them off the grass. But then you've lost the grass in terms of it fulfilling its purpose, you see. But we do have this tendency and always have in our society. We do with children. 
it's, it doesn't do any good to take a toddler, two-year-old, one-year-old, tell him, now, don't get away from this yard. He doesn't understand that, so you put a fence around the yard. Keep him in. Lock him up. And you do it for his good. And it's right that you should. But it's not right that he stay in a fenced-in yard all of his life. Sometime, the fences have to go, and he has to develop a, an awareness of self-reliance. Whether he does or not depends a great deal on the kind of influence and example and teaching that he's had. And that's a part of society's uh, uh, responsibility. But in terms of divine laws, and especially in terms of such things as creeds and codes and commandments, which have been crystallized in religion, we build fences and keep them there through now and all eternity. You cannot kill. All right. So that's the moral law. And if I'm going to be a moral, upright uh, Jew or Christian or Christian science or unity student, uh, I must not kill anybody. All right. I won't kill anybody. I feel very right and righteous about it. I may kill them a thousand times in myself, but I don't do it. No, sir, not me. I'm, my hands are clean. But all the while, we're tearing ourselves apart inside. And most of the ills, from a psychosomatic point of view, of the physical body come from just this area, of the frustration of the urge to violence. Now, what are you going to do? Give vent to it? You know, there's some that say, don't frustrate things. You know, let it out. They say, if you, have, if you have thoughts, violent thoughts, then speak them, and it might help if you shout at the person a little bit. Call him names and so forth and pour your venom out at him. Or as someone might say, if you can excuse the language, vomit all over them. Does that solve the problem? There are those who think it does. I don't think it does at all. But he hasn't really solved your problem. You've simply given yourself a temporary release. You've just released your, your pent-up emotions and you've released the garbage out of your stomach and it's gone for a while. But uh, if the system hasn't changed, it'll be right back again in time. So this kind of person spends all of his life spewing it out, telling everybody, laying it out, just like it is, saying the things that come to his mind, and he feels very clean and healthy about it. Nobody likes to associate with him, of course. <laughs> but he's not solving his problems. He's not coming to understand himself. The only way that you can destroy an enemy, much as you feel you could knock his head against a wall, the only way you can destroy him is to love him. There's no other way. That's hard, but that's the law. Because the only enemy that you can ever really know is the enmity in your own consciousness. And that's yours. Nobody put it there. It's yours. It's your thoughts. Perverted, frustrated as they may be, it's in you. And you have to deal with it on that level. The person who is always angry at the world is really angry within and at himself. He may lash out at the world, but he feels inadequate, he feels insecure, he feels unworthy, he has no self-respect, and so he's constantly trying to destroy himself. And that's a kind of killing, too. And he does it by spewing it out on everybody else. Psychiatrists say that most people who kill or do violent things are acting to a large extent, a frighteningly large extent, from paranoid feelings. The feeling that people are against them, people are picking on them, nobody likes me, people are saying things behind my back, and so forth. And this will build up within the person, and suddenly he will lash out, he may lash out at one person, but it actually comes from the fact that deep within himself he feels unworthy, he feels insignificant, he feels unwanted. He does not know or respect himself. This is probably like the, like the, boss, the, the man who comes home from work at night and he's been having a terrible time at the office. His boss has been unmercifully on him. And because of the worker-boss relationship, he, he has to hold it in or he'll lose his job, so he doesn't say anything. He smiles and does what he, but he's building it up inside, and he comes home at night, and the moment the wife opens the door, he lashes out at her and gives her a biting, and metaphysically or, or psychologically, and he says all sorts of terrible things. She's very upset about this. 
she, if she really understood, she would know that this is a backhanded compliment because he feels comfortable with her and that's why he lets it all out where she is, you see. It's very hard for her to be that realistic. <laughs> but this is the way we are, you see, and so much of the violent activity that goes on in our life comes because we build it up in ourselves and because we feel that the world is against us and we're lashing out at the world. And we do that so often. Many people start fighting and lashing out at the world as soon as they get up in the morning. And they keep the battle going all day long. First they grumble about the weather and then they find fault with their wives or their husbands or their children or their in-laws or their pet peeves. On their way to work they push and shove on buses and subways and they talk about those animals, you know, <laughs> that are realizing that they're acting like an animal too. In conversation, they talk about the high cost of living and the taxes and those darn politicians and the stock market and last night's terrible program on television. <laughs> During coffee breaks, they collect in little clans and gossip about Bill's ex-girlfriend and Hilda's new hairdo. <laughs> and then at five o'clock, there's a repeat of the scramble for seats on the buses and the subways and the complaint that it's a heck of a way to run a railroad. And through it all, there is this constant thought, not always in these words, but in the emotions and the feelings and the nonverbal experience, that just kills me. That kills me. Watch yourself. Watch your reaction to things when you're driving in your car and somebody cuts in front of you or just as you're about to to go in an intersection, a great big bus pulls around you and stops right in front of you to let passengers out. Mmm, that kills me, you know, so forth. Watch yourself and realize that these are the areas that this commandment is talking about, and it's something that we can do if we realize that life, as we say so often, is an inward-out process, not an outward-in. You see, we assume that things out there in the world, the bus driver or the big old bus itself or people or organizations or the boss, that mean old boss or the governments or the politicians or the tax man that audits your taxes or the clerk in the bank that stands and talks with, with a customer while you're standing behind there and hurry to get back to work, all these things, we think that the weather, food, situations can harm us or hurt us or take away what is ours. Because we've grown up in the consciousness that it's all out here in the world and you've got to get it and get it ahead of other people. And other people are trying to take it away from you. And you're running here and running there and anxious. Don't let him do this. Don't let him take that from you. He hurts my good name as if your name was tacked on you and somebody can pull it off, you know. He hurts my character as if your character were like a shadow that somebody could step on, you know. And so it's all this feeling that it's out here. And there's this constant pressure and tension and fear and anxiety. But you see, the underlying principle of the commandment, thou shalt not kill, is basically, you cannot kill, there's no way, and nobody can kill. Nothing on the outside can harm or hinder you. You can only try to destroy yourself, and then you only destroy your attitudes and your feelings and your security and so forth. There's no way you can kill, because in the largest sense of the word, life is an eternal experience. You don't give life and you can't take it away. Now, that may be a, a healthy rationalization if someone has actually died in the process, but we're, we're talking about the divine law involved. We so easily lose sight of that and get caught up in the expediency of situations. Nobody can harm you or hinder you or hurt your good name or destroy your reputation. Nobody can take anything from you that is of any real value to your own growth and unfoldment except as you take it within yourself and it becomes a self-destructive negative attitude. And because this self-destructive process is going on in you, then often things begin to deteriorate out here, as within, so without. But the deterioration came as a result of your consciousness, not as a result of the act of someone else. Now that's a very important thing, but that's at the heart and root of this commandment. The point is, all this goes on in your mind, and it is your mind. No matter that you're fearful or anxious or bitter about something that's happened to you, if it happens in you, 
then it is the result of your reaction. The incident is external, but the reaction is your own, you see. No one can in any way take anything from you or destroy you or hurt you unless you take the things that happen out here as marvelous opportunities for inner turmoil and self-pity. Anybody can give you an opportunity to feel sorry for yourself, to be upset and angry and hostile and bitter, but nobody can make you upset or angry or hostile or bitter. Nobody. No one. I don't care who they are. You say, he makes me so mad. Nobody makes you mad. He gives you a marvelous opportunity to do what you will, and you say, I'm going to get mad. You get mad because either by habit or by subtle conscious direction, that's the way you choose to deal with it. And many of us have formed the habit of anger and the habit of hostility and the habit of resistance. It's a part of our consciousness. And we accept that as what we are. It's not what we are at all. It's what we've done with what we are. But we can change it, you see. No person, no group, no race, no social system, no nation was ever destroyed from the outside. This is, this is common knowledge. Always the fall is the result of self-destruction. It's always an inside job. And you can't do much about the things that happen out there not in the beginning. You can't do too much about what you see on television. You can turn it off, or you can use the law of reversibility, as it were, and send back love and peace, send a thought of blessing to everybody involved without getting terribly upset or sympathetic, but in a compassionate sense. You can do this. You can't change the things, but you can determine what it does to you. That you can do, and that's your responsibility, and you can't get away from it, because that's divine law. Many people waste most of their lives thinking how they're being hurt, how they're being held back, how their life would be so good if it wasn't for what he did to me, or if it wasn't for this person I married, or if it wasn't for the job that I'm stuck with, or if it wasn't that I lived in this country or this part of town or with these people. Or if it wasn't that, that I had these weather conditions, or if the stock market didn't come along and take all my money away from me. You know, things are always holding us back, we think. And many people live all their lives in this state of consciousness, looking for excuses out here for things that are actually going on in consciousness. And as long as a person thinks this way, he's going to get nowhere. Life is going to be a reflection of exactly what he thinks it is being. He's always standing in his own way. He's always his own obstacle. But as soon as he understands the truth, realizes that there's no way in which anyone can take anything from me, there's no way that the world out here can have any effect or influence upon me at all except that I allow it to be an influence on my consciousness and I allow it because of my reaction. It's mine. It's my mind. And I have the responsibility for it. I have to live with it, but I can change it. Then, I, as I know the truth in that sense, then I'm free. Free to do and be what I want to do and be no matter what the world does. Remember, Jesus says, agree with thine adversary quickly. And that's one that some people find a hard time dealing with. But you see, the only adversary that we ever have is our adverse reaction toward the person or the situation. The adversary, again, is within ourselves. Deal with it in this way. And we will destroy the enmity. We will turn the situation around and give a new free expression to love. And we will solve the problem as far as we're concerned. Now, this word agree comes from a word which means to be well-minded or to have a right attitude. So when it says agree with your attitude, with your adversary, it means get your attitude right about the adversary and know that it's not the person, but it's what you think about the person. You know, you can learn something, and we'll close with this, you can learn something, I think, very interesting and helpful from the lowly oyster. The oyster is normally a very placid fellow. Occasionally, little grains of sand work their way inside of the oyster's shell, and they irritate him. And he's not beyond being irritated by irritation, so he does whatever he can to get rid of the grain of sand. But when he finds that he can't do it, then the oyster does something that we could all look at and follow after. He settles down and produces one of the most priceless and beautiful things in the world. He turns the irritation into a pearl. 
Whatever the problem, whatever the challenge, whatever the challenging situation or the challenging person, rather than let ourselves follow the pattern of, of killing thoughts, destructive thoughts, negative consciousness, we ought to get busy doing some purling. It's a mighty, mighty, wonderful approach to life. But anyway, this deals with the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. It seemed like such a simple commandment, we kind of complicated it, didn't we? But then we're dealing with law, and law is inexorable. All right. Now let's, uh, let's take a few moments to uh, engage in an experience of giving. Now I like to make very clear, and, uh, and I think that if we're interested in the truth at all, it's important that we get into this attitude, that giving in a time like this is not just a matter of paying the rent and fulfilling the obligations, and after all, they need something to get by in these times, so I better do my little bit. That isn't what it's all about. That may be a secondary effect. But you're here, I assume, because you're seeking to gain a greater insight into life and into yourself. Don't miss the opportunity in this experience of giving to bring it into that kind of consciousness. In other words, you give, not that somebody needs your gift and you're giving to it, but you give because you understand that life is a flow of substance and love and intelligence, and you want to give way to the flow. And so the giving experience is an exercise and a marvelous discipline to get the consciousness thinking in terms of give rather than receive. We spend most of our life out there in the world, get, 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 always with our hand out. We have to learn to give, and I'm not talking just about giving money, that's that's a symbol, it's, a, it's an opportunity to demonstrate it, but to give way and to get the thought that life is an inward-out process. So this giving act, whatever you yourself are involved in at this particular time, is a marvelous exercise in the flow of the divine process. Don't miss this opportunity. Otherwise, you, you, you actually shortchange yourself if you just drop money in the basket and say, well, I did my part. You're not doing the part for somebody else. Are you doing it for yourself? Are you really fulfilling the need to open this inward channel. Get the thought of giving way. And that's why we like to take this affirmation together. Divine love flowing through me blesses and increases all that I give and all that I receive. And emphasize flowing through me. Do we know that together? Divine love flowing through me blesses and increases all that I give and all that I receive. And keep in that consciousness and don't let it go. Carry it with you when you leave here tonight. And so be it. And as we go on our way tonight, I want us to just take a brief moment now to make the commitment. You see, we've been dealing with law, laws that are commended to us, but uh, you don't do enough if you just kind of observe them or keep the commandments. We want to make a commitment to the fundamental spiritual process that we've dealt with. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a moment now. We've talked a good bit, and we have thought a good bit, and we've laughed a good bit, and perhaps we've felt an inner turmoil and disturbance a good bit. But now for a moment, let's realize that what this law is all about is the law of the healthy mind, the law of the free and open channel of constructive, orderly, loving consciousness. That's all. So when it says, thou shalt not kill, it's really trying to help you to understand that you can't kill, so there's no point in getting involved in it. You can't really hurt the other person. The other person can't hurt you. So let's make a commitment to keeping ourselves in the flow of love so that whenever, the next time we begin to react in anger or hostility, we will immediately stop, agree with the adversary quickly, get our thoughts right for a moment, say, now, wait a minute, what am I doing? There's no way in which I can get revenge on this person. I don't really want to. And if I am involved in that attitude, then I'm going to hurt myself. His consciousness will take care of him. The divine law is at work. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So I'm going to think now, what is right for me? And as Jesus said, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Follow the Christ consciousness. Follow the flow of love. 
And let the experience and the exercise and the moment that provoked that sense of hostility cause you to invoke a higher law, a higher awareness, and to evoke a spiritual principle by speaking the positive word for yourself. And so we now commit ourselves to this practice. We know that these things don't come easy, but we know that we're dealing with fundamental law, and as we work and work and keep on and keep on until we catch on, then we will come to experience a whole new level of consciousness and a new flow of harmonious experiences in our lives. And we give thanks for that. Amen.